to the, here we go, sorry, uh, try that again. Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the LPL evening lecture series. Uh, this is part of the 50th anniversary of the Lunar and Planetary Laboratory here. And uh, it's sort of appropriate, uh, through, through the year we've been having uh, talks by some of our alumni, ranging from some of the first alumni to some of the latest. Um, I'll introduce Colin in a, in a minute here, but I do want to mention that our next and uh, final evening lecture for the year is on Tuesday, the, is that 16th of November? Uh, by Dr. David Choi, talking about uh, weather, weather everywhere, basically, giving the weather report for giant planets. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention was stick around afterwards. There are some new high-rise posters of Mars. I haven't seen them yet. They're hot off the press, and we'll have a drawing for a couple of those. Um, so I, to the, tonight's speaker is Dr. Colin Dundas. Colin went to, got his undergraduate degree at Caltech, and then got his PhD here uh, in 2009, has been working on Mars, and tonight he, he's working with the high-rise team with the uh, camera in orbit currently around Mars, and tonight is talking, his title is Mars on Ice, Dynamic Processes on the Cold Martian Surface. Colin. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I'd like to uh, first uh, thank Tim and the organizers for inviting some of the yo younger graduates to speak. Uh, David and I are both uh, relatively recent graduates, and I have to admit that when I first saw that we'd been invited, I was a little worried that there'd been a plane crash or something <laughs> and we'd lost some of the older students. Uh, but uh, today I'm going to talk about results from high rise uh, in the orbit around Mars, uh, especially dynamic processes showing that Mars is currently a changing place. And these results from HiRISE, I'd just like to also add an acknowledgement uh, to the entire HiRISE team. Uh, scientists across the U.S. have uh, worked on this camera, and it's operated here at the University of Arizona, just across the street. And it, all of the stuff I'm going to show you is some things I've done and some things they've done, and it wouldn't be possible without uh, what they and uh, the various other targeting specialists and downlink people have done as well. And so I'd just like to start out by thanking them. So to give you a roadmap for what I'm going to talk about today, I'm first going to give you a very brief introduction to Mars and then tell you a little bit about the high-rise camera. And then I'm going to wade into some results from high-rise, looking first at uh, some more ancient Mars and then moving to uh, more recent processes and finally wrapping up by talking about some things that are happening on Mars today and in the very recent past and showing that Mars is indeed a very dynamic place. And because this is the LPL 50th anniversary, I know that many of the previous speakers have been talking a little bit about their experiences with LPL or their memories of the lab. And it wouldn't really be all that interesting for me to tell stories about LPL back in 2007. So what I've done instead is interspersed a few pictures from field trips that we've done uh, as graduate students, uh, looking at features around the Southwest that are analogs to things we see on Mars. And uh, so I've uh, placed those uh, within the slides, and I think they'll provide an interesting comparison for some of the things we're seeing on Mars. So just to get you all oriented, uh, Mars is about half the diameter of Earth, about a, a little more than a tenth of the mass. And the surface area of Mars, the land area, is about the same as the land area of Earth. Uh, the difference is that Earth has oceans taking up three quarters of the surface. But it's a very big area. There's a lot to explore. Uh, the average distance of Mars from the sun is about one and a half times that of Earth. Uh, so further away makes it much colder. Uh, the surface temperatures can get down to about uh, minus 200 Fahrenheit. And at the warmest, the very thin top layers of the soil can get up to just around the warm enough to melt water. Uh, the atmospheric pressure is extremely low. It's less than 1% that of Earth. And it's a very thin atmosphere of carbon dioxide. And the surface gravity is about 40% uh, Earth. So it's in many ways Earth-like, but there are also these uh, clear uh, differences that are uh, some of the things I'll talk about later. So geographically, to help you orient yourself, this is a map of the topography of Mars. And the major features to notice are that there are smooth northern plains with few impact craters. 
Uh, and those are a relatively young surface. Uh, by young, it may mean on the order of a, a billion years or less. It's not anything like as young as on Earth. Uh, there's in the southern highlands many more impact craters, including some very large basins. Uh, this is the Hellas Basin here, and this is Argyre. And then here is uh, Valles Marineris, one of the, large, or the largest canyon anywhere in the solar system. Uh, this is thousands of miles long. Uh, for reference, uh, the United States would stretch from about there uh, in Washington to Maine, somewhere over here. So this, cam uh, this canyon is about the same uh, length as the United States. Uh, this is the Tharsis Volcanic Province. These are uh, the Tharsis Montes, and this is Olympus Mons, the largest volcano in the solar system. Uh, this is the Elysium Volcanic Province, which is uh, similar but smaller. And uh, we'll be going on a tour of some things high-rise has seen at uh, locations across the surface. So now I'd just like to tell you a little bit about high-rise so that you know uh, what we're going to be looking at in the future slides. A uh, high-rise is the most powerful camera that's ever been sent uh, to another planet. And the, uh, the resolution, the scale that we're able to image at, is similar to what you'd see in the best uh, coverage in Google Earth. Uh, we have uh, pixels or, uh, of about uh, 25 or 30 centimeters, uh, about one foot wide. And so, and in the center of each image, uh, we have a swath that's in color. Unfortunately, that doesn't go across the entire image, but most of what I'm going to show you is still from these center strips because the color is one of the more spectacular things that we've seen. Uh, High-rise uh, orbits Mars at about uh, three kilometers per second, uh, two miles per second. Uh, it's moving along at a good clip, and it uh, takes uh, push broom images that are built up line by line. So unlike your digital camera, which is a framing camera, which uh, simply takes a square or a rectangular image that's the same size every time, uh, high-rise just uh, builds up one line after another, uh, just scanning along a single strip. And if uh, movies work, which is always a gamble, this is essentially what high-rise does. As it's moving along in its orbit, it picks up line by line at a time and builds up images so that we can make very long in this way. And this crater is also interesting, and I'll be talking about it more later in the, uh, this talk. So now uh, let's uh, start moving into the high-rise observations. Uh, high-rise has been in orbit for four years, and it's completed almost 20,000 observations of Mars. Uh, 14 million mega megapixels uh, makes up for over 14 terabytes of data returned from Mars. But despite all of that, we've only managed to cover about 1% of the surface. And because in places we're repeating coverage to look for changes, it's actually even less than that. So give us another uh, 100 years and we'll actually cover the whole planet. Uh, High-rise has observed, uh, uh, one of the in more interesting things we've observed is uh, rocks in the centers of craters uh, that have been uplifted from great depth. And this is a way to probe some of the older crust on Mars and see some of the earliest rocks. Uh, in these craters, uh, after the, uh, say, an asteroid hits and uh, compresses the surface, the center is actually uplifted. And so these rocks are uh, from kilometers deep in the largest craters. These rocks turn out to be uh, very diverse, and they're often very colorful. And uh, you can see here, these are rocks in the central peak of an impact crater, lifted up from a couple kilometers down. And you can see a wide range of colors. Uh, there's also a wide range of mineralogies, which we know from the CRISM spectrometer. We've seen somewhat similar things on Earth. On, uh, this was from a LPL trip to the Canyonlands in Utah. And this is Upheaval Dome, uh, an impact crater a few kilometers across. And uh, there, just like on Mars in the center, we see some very diverse rocks in the center that have been lifted up uh, from much lower down in the section. And uh, this provides a sampling of uh, the lower crust of Earth, just like it does on Mars. Uh, this is uh, another uh, high-rise image of ancient rocks. These are from Marth Vallis, uh, where uh, there are some of the most ancient sedimentary layers anywhere in the solar system exposed. These are probably somewhere on the order of four billion years old, and uh, results from the CRISM spectrometer suggest that these are phyllosilicates or clays. Uh, this is one of the sites that's being considered as a landing site for the next Mars rover uh, launching next year. And again, the color diversity here is uh, suggestive of compositional diversity, and the fact that we're seeing uh, phyllosilicates and clays 
uh, tells us that Mars uh, isn't just uh, a surface of lava and more lava, but there's been uh, quite a bit more going on. There's been alteration probably by water. And it's produced a really spectacular surface. And again on Mars, we've seen uh, all kinds of sedimentary rocks. Uh, these are layers from Becquerel Crater. And uh, in this case, what's particularly interesting about these layers is that there are sort of, you can see these regular steps. And this sort of uh, cyclic pattern or repetitive pattern suggests some process, and we don't know exactly what, uh, that was repeating on an annual or longer time scale and building up a layer of comparable size each time. So this could be something like a series of sand dunes all migrating at about the same speed, each leaving behind a layer. Or it could be annual layers in a lake or layers that were modulated by variations in Mars's orbit over a much longer time scale. But uh, these rocks are probably telling us something about the ancient history of Mars. And there's a record there of what things were like probably far uh, beyond the age of anything we can have on, we see on Earth. The ancient rocks aren't all just layers. Uh, these are uh, inverted streams in Antoniadi Crater. And we've nicknamed these uh, tree ferns. Uh, but what's going on here is uh, that uh, there was once uh, streams or rivers uh, flowing across parts of the Martian surface for some length of time. And uh, those streams, uh, at some point, uh, became cemented, or possibly uh, they simply have more resistant rocks on the surface. And so uh, later, after they were buried and eroded, uh, the stream actually stands up above the surrounding ground. And so this is uh, inverted topography, but it shows us uh, something about uh, ancient Mars in that there were streams at some point flowing across the surface. Uh, near Valles Marineris, that uh, very large canyon, uh, we see uh, very diverse layered rocks. Uh, this is uh, uh, some... Uh, uh, these are some light-toned rocks with uh, dark banding, and these, again, have very diverse mineralogies as well. Uh, near, in this area, they've uh, it's been found uh, opal, hydrated silica, and uh, all kinds of other minerals. So this is, again, telling us that early Mars had a very diverse uh, geologic history. And again, uh, with, uh, on LPL field trips, we've looked at uh, layered sedimentary rocks. Uh, this is, again, from Utah. Uh, these are, in this case, sandstone layers that have been uh, bleached and altered by water. And this kind of alteration uh, may be the same sort of thing that caught some of these diverse minerals that we see on the Martian surface. Uh, Mars also has uh, ancient salt deposits. Uh, this is a little dark, uh, but uh, these are uh, another set of uh, light-toned rocks uh, that were uh, possibly evaporites uh, laid down in some uh, playa lake or some area of desiccation. Uh, these are uh, thought to be chloride salts. And uh, we've seen these uh, in the southwest as well. Uh, this is from the floor of Death Valley. And uh, this is a playa lake surface, uh, generally bone dry. This is at the lowest point in the western hemisphere. And there are layers of salt on the surface. And uh, the same sort of thing may have been what helped build up these salt layers on Mars. So we haven't just been looking at uh, sedimentary rocks. We've also been looking at craters. Uh, this is a very fresh crater. And you can see uh, with high rise some amazing detail in the ejecta. There's radial structures where materials uh, uh, flowed out after this impact blast occurred. Uh, this is about uh, a mile across. It's similar in size to Meteor Crater. Uh, this is uh, another of these fresh craters. Uh, this is the rim here. And you can, what we can see here is uh, that boulders have tumbled down the slope, and uh, there are, again, layered rocks uh, seen around the rim. And we've, again, uh, been able to look at the same kind of processes on LPL trips here in Arizona. Uh, this is Meteor Crater near Flagstaff. I'm sure some of you have visited it. And again, uh, the rim of the crater is a great place uh, to look for exposures of rocks that we wouldn't otherwise be able to see. And geologists on Earth frequently use uh, road cuts as a way to get a look at uh, rocks that uh, would ordinarily be buried and not well exposed. But on Mars, impact craters like this one are sort of the interplanetary road cuts that give us a chance to see some things that would otherwise be covered by dust. 
And you can see also here that rocks have been tumbling down off the flanks uh, just as they do on uh, Mars. And the size of these rocks and their presence has actually uh, been studied by LPL graduates as well. And the distribution of boulders around craters can actually tell you something about whether they're primary craters formed by asteroid impacts or secondary craters that formed by debris thrown out of another crater. I mentioned that Mars wasn't just a series of lava flows stacked one on top of the other, but there's plenty of lava on Mars, including some of the youngest very large lava flows anywhere in the solar system. Uh, this is uh, from the tip of the Athabasca Vallis lava flow. And what you're looking at here uh, is a lava surface that's surrounded this point of rock, and then it's inflated. So it uh, surrounded the rock and then cooled enough to develop a strong resistant crust. But then more lava was injected and lifted up the surface. And so that's why you can see this step here, uh, stepping up onto the lava surface. Uh, this is uh, fairly common in large lava flows, and it's one of the things that helps them flow very long distances. Because since the lava can travel under this crust, it's insulated and it doesn't cool down as quickly. And so this is a process that occurs on both Earth and Mars. It's, again, something that we can look at here in our own backyard. Uh, on one of our recent field trips, uh, Rick Greenberg, who's a professor in the department, uh, is a pilot, and he offered to do an overflight of the field trip while we were on a lava flow. And so this is uh, a lava flow in southern New Mexico. Uh, here's about half the field trip class uh, standing on the surface of this flow. And you can see again here that the same thing has happened here as on Mars, that this flow was emplaced and then lifted up. And so you can see these cracks along the edges uh, where the top was lifted and fractured as uh, the lava was inflating the flow. Mars also has some volcanic features that we don't have good analogs for here in, our own, uh, in Arizona. This is actually probably a mud volcano on the northern plains. Uh, there are mud volcanoes on Earth. They form when you have uh, water and fine-grained sediments at, under high pressure, and they get squeezed out onto the surface. And uh, these are common in, uh, uh, frequently in areas where there's uh, petroleum. And this, uh, on Earth, uh, some of the best examples are in Azerbaijan, in the Caucasus. Uh, this is from the northern plains of Mars. It's a few hundred meters across, a few football fields. And so these indicate some episode in the past history of Mars when the ground was very wet and under pressure, and uh, it was wet enough and under enough pressure to squeeze the stuff out onto the surface and build up these cones and hills all over the plains. And there's tens of thousands of these covering the plains all, all over the northern hemisphere. Moving on to some things that uh, change a little more. This is an example of a wind streak on Mars. Uh, it's, these form downwind from impact craters and hills. Uh, as the wind's blowing over, they can either, uh, you can either get preferential deposition or erosion uh, behind an obstacle because the wind speed changes. Uh, these have been actually observed to change uh, over tens of years of observing Mars. We've seen uh, cases where there were major dust storms, and then looking back at a crater or a hill, you can see that the streak has changed. It's been eroded or covered by dust, or the direction has changed. And although you wouldn't, actually, you wouldn't come across these very often, there is an example of one of these in California. And that's uh, rather dark on the screen, but this is actually a volcano here. It's Amboy Crater. And below, behind it, uh, there's uh, this dark wind streak, which is, again, something that we've looked at uh, on field trips. And what we actually did the last time we were there was try to actually find the edge of the streak using aerial photos, but wandering around on the ground. And uh, this took some effort. This is actually the edge of the streak. Uh, you can see that there's a little bit more rock within the streak rather than outside it. But uh, stepping up onto that small volcano, the cinder cone, we used the umbrella to mark the edge. And then from up above, you can actually see this is, again, the edge of the streak here. And we were actually able to track this down. And it was a really good exercise in comparing remote sensing data, such as aerial photos or satellite photos like we get with high rise with what you actually would see on the surface. And the same sort of thing is really important for things like uh, the rovers that are still operating on Mars. Uh, they use high-rise photos to help them navigate 
And uh, it's very important to be able to translate uh, what we can see from orbit to what's actually going on on the surface. And it, in this case, uh, we were actually able to do it. And it was a very good exercise because uh, looking back, this is not at all obvious when you're standing there. It's uh, just a slight difference in the concentration of rocks. But it adds up to what looks like a very significant feature from up above. Mars also has sand dunes, and that came out extremely dark. Uh, these are uh, sand dunes in uh, Matara Crater. Uh, what you're seeing, uh, the illuminated faces here are the slip faces of the dune, the steep faces, uh, where sand uh, builds up and then tumbles down the surface. And uh, the dunes on Mars are very similar to those on Earth. Uh, they're at least as big, if not bigger, in some cases. And uh, these are, again, something we can see here in Arizona and New Mexico. And these are the, actually the Kelso Dunes in California. Uh, this, the crest of this dune is several hundred feet high. It's about the same height as those dunes from the previous slide. And you can also see uh, smaller ripples on the surfaces of dunes on Earth. And I'm guessing you probably couldn't see them in that previous slide, but we see the same kind of ripples, although a bit larger, on the surface of Mars. And these actually indicate uh, the wind sweeping over the surface and building up these regular organized patterns. And there's actually been some very recent work that's shown that the ripples on Mars actually move, which is very exciting because after 30 years of watching dunes on Mars, we'd never really seen much movement. But with HiRISE, we finally got uh, good enough resolution and enough detail that we could actually compare two pictures and see that uh, ripples had moved. And so uh, this is one of the examples of a dynamic Mars today. There are actually things changing on the current surface. Uh, the winds are strong enough to be moving sand. And uh, so uh, that's one of the more interesting similarities uh, between Earth and Mars. But as we'll get into a, a bit later, there are uh, many other dynamic processes. We've also looked at the rovers. Uh, this little speck here is actually the Opportunity rover on the surface of Mars uh, at uh, Victoria Crater. And the rover uh, went around the rim, explored, and eventually uh, went inside the crater. And uh, HiRISE has provided uh, support for, for these observations uh, by providing a detailed topography and showing them the best route across the surface. And on field trips with LPL, we also have our own experience with roving. And like the rovers, we occasionally have issues with the wheels. And uh, the Spirit rover, the one I didn't show, uh, has a stuck wheel. And that was a real problem for their operations as they were dragging a stuck wheel across the surface. Luckily, we did have a spare tire, but they don't have that luxury. So one of the most exciting uh, things uh, from the last few years of Mars study has been finding new impact craters. So we can. We always expected that small asteroids would hit the surface, and meteorites come into the Earth's atmosphere every night. And, uh, but we can actually now, with before and after images, see places where new craters have formed. And the way we usually do this is with some of the lower resolution cameras uh, that cover much larger areas. We look in dusty areas, and then when one of these small asteroids or meteorites hits the surface, it creates a blast area that's uh, much larger than the crater itself. And it clears off the dust and forms a dark patch, uh, which we can then follow up on with high rise and get a much more detailed look. And so this is actually telling us uh, an estimate of the impact cratering rate on Mars, how many of these things are forming every day and every year. And this is important because we like to use craters to get some idea of how old the surface is. An older surface has been sitting there being hit by meteorites for longer. It should have more craters. But in order to really translate it, that into something useful like an actual age, we need to know just how fast that's happening. And so observing how many of these new craters are forming every year gives us a way to calibrate uh, uh, that uh, effort. And so, uh, these are also telling us about the impact processes themselves. And the scale of this blast pattern, for instance, tells us something about the shock uh, from the meteorite when it hit. And you can also see up here, uh, this exclusion zone is probably because this meteorite came in at an angle. And so the shock wave wasn't expanding perfectly spherically. Uh, 
And so we wound up with this asymmetric uh, pattern in the blast. Uh, some of these craters have had other effects. Uh, here, uh, a crater hit a dusty slope and it kicked off a major avalanche. And there's actually, uh, just at the core of this dark area here, a small crater a couple feet across. Uh, but it was large enough to blast out uh, an area about the size of a football field and then uh, kick off dust avalanching down the slope uh, for hundreds of feet. So Mars, I've mostly been talking about uh, dry, old, sedimentary rocks and dust up till now. But Mars also has seasons, just like Earth. Uh, the axis is tilted, and so sometimes uh, one hemisphere is pointed towards the sun and gets more sunlight. Uh, at other times, it tilts away. And uh, what actually can happen on Mars is that part of the atmosphere will freeze out. The carbon dioxide is uh, thin enough and it gets cold enough that it freezes out it in the winter hemisphere and builds up a layer of this dry ice snow uh, that can be several feet thick. And this is actually uh, very active when it defrosts, because in some cases it forms a transparent slab of ice, uh, not just a pile of snow. And in that case, it heats up from the bottom. And then you have uh, gas bubbling out from underneath, and it can actually move sand and dust around. And this produces some of the most spectacular and active processes we see on Mars today. Uh, this is from up near the North Pole. This is a sand dune here. And all these little black spots are actually sand that's been kicked out uh, by this degassing dry ice as it's uh, sublimating into the atmosphere. It's doing so energetically enough to kick this stuff up on top of the ice and make uh, blast patterns all over the surface. And so these are actually essentially gas geysers. And they're thought to reach maybe 100 meters in the air. It's a very energetic and active process. And the same process can actually reshape the surface as well. Uh, this is uh, what we call a spider. Uh, it's an area of uh, these small channels that all converge towards a central point. And uh, rather than being carved by water and flowing downhill, these are carved by gas, and they tend to flow uphill. So as the gas is sublimating at the base of this layer of dry ice snow, it tries to flow uphill. and Either it flows out through cracks in the ice, which is where you get those smaller patches, as I showed on the last slide. Uh, or sometimes uh, you get many of these channels converging, and the gas will be moving fast enough that it actually drags a little bit of the sand or dust along with it. And so it carves out these uphill flowing channels up near the South Pole. And that's uh, extremely dark, so I'll just skip that one. Uh, the CO2 up at the uh, South Pole is actually permanent. Uh, near the North Pole, it goes away every year. But at the South Pole, there's a small residual cap of this stuff that stays around year round. Uh, this is about 30 feet thick, and it covers many square miles. So this is a lot of dry ice. And it actually forms uh, what we call Swiss cheese patterns as it uh, varies through the years. Uh, small imperfections on the surface are dents or holes, uh, for whatever reason, uh, once the, a depression forms on the surface, uh, the walls will get a bit more sunlight because uh, they're facing a little bit towards the equator. They're tilted. And so that makes the ice unstable, and it starts to sublimate and expand. And so you start with a pit like this, and it expands to something more like this or this. And these walls keep growing and expanding. And you develop this very complicated landscape where this uh, carbon dioxide is deposited on the flat areas, but these walls are cutting back and eroding. And so we can actually see changes year to year as individual pits grow larger and larger. And you can see in the walls also uh, layers. And what these layers may be recording is dust storms uh, that have deposited layers of uh, dust on the surface and caused a particularly dark layer. Uh, and then afterwards, uh, the next year, say, didn't have a dust storm, and you form a brighter layer subsequently. And we can actually watch these expand year to year, uh, see the layers in the walls. And if we could ever actually get in there and take a detailed uh, core through the, uh, this ice deposit, it would tell us about the history of Mars and the dust storms of Mars over several hundred years.
Uh, the dry ice also uh, avalanches down the surface. And uh, we've actually seen in action avalanches coming off some very steep scarps up near the pole. Uh, this is, again, pretty dark. I apologize. But you can see here the front of an avalanche cloud uh, sliding down the surface. And so you have these very steep scarps. And then uh, as spring comes around, uh, they warm up and things become unstable. And so instead of uh, the degassing phenomena that we see elsewhere, we just get avalanches of dry ice and dust uh, crashing down on the surface. And you might think that something like this would be pretty rare. But when we actually image these during the right season, when we look at these scarps, we've got a very good chance in a single image that covers only less than a second to take of picking up one or more avalanches going on. So this is happening all the time, constantly during the spring. It's incredibly active. It must be really impressive to stand back and watch one of these scarps if there are avalanches occurring every few minutes. The Mars also has ground ice. And uh, in following the water on Mars, which has been NASA's uh, goal for the past decade of exploration, you ultimately get to ice at the present. And the reason we're interested in water is that it's important to understanding the geology of Mars, the geomorphology, uh, the chemistry, uh, the climate, and any possible uh, astrobiology as well. If, there's, if there is life on Mars, or if there was, uh, it was almost certainly related to water. And so studying the water will help us get a handle on uh, any possible life, or if there was no life, uh, why there was not. So up above, uh, we've got a model prediction for where there should be ground ice on Mars. It should be uh, near the poles uh, from about 45 degrees latitude north. So this is from a little below the Canadian border north on Earth. And as you get closer to the pole, it should get shallower. So these red areas are the areas where the ice should start a few feet below the surface and then occur below that. As you get towards yellow and green, it should just be a couple of inches. And in the areas where it's blue, it should be much less than an inch from the surface. So we think uh, we had a theoretical understanding of uh, where the ice should be. And one of the things we can look for to test this is uh, this polygonal texture. And the reason this forms where you have ground ice is that the temperature variations cause the ice to expand and contract. And it wants to expand and contract in all three directions. So it can rise and fall easily enough. There's no problem with that. But when it tries to contract, the entire surface is trying to contract. And so what happens is that it breaks every winter. And after that happens over and over again for thousands of years, you form these polygonal patterns that organize themselves uh, into uh, networks in order to sort of uh, minim minimize the energy required for the cracking. And so although there's all kinds of ways to get polygonal patterns, uh, this is one of the best ones. And all over the uh, northern and southern highlands, at the high latitudes, we see this kind of texture. And so this is the first test of uh, looking of where there should be ice on Mars. And it works pretty well. Uh, this is where we ex these occur where we expect ice to be. But you could also have had climate change on Mars. As the orbit varies, we expect the areas of ice uh, to move towards the equator and away, uh, depending on just how much the axis of Mars is tilted. And these polygons could be left behind uh, from climate change. So it's still interesting to get a closer look. And uh, that's uh, something that the Phoenix mission did. And the Phoenix mission uh, was actually imaged by high rise as it was landing. Uh, this was the parachute of the spacecraft as it's coming in. And this is the lander itself. And the Phoenix mission run here at, the, at Arizona was uh, landed on the surface uh, in the area where we expect ice. And you can see this rocky plain. Uh, has the same sort of polygons as in the image I just showed. And then they started digging. And within a couple inches of the surface, exactly where it was predicted, they hit ice. And you can see here they actually hit some very bright ice. We thought that most ice on Mars in the ground would be dark. It would just be filling in the pore spaces of the dirt. But some of what they found was very bright. And it's very clean ice. And so that's still a puzzle. It's something that we're trying to understand, uh, how you could get relatively pure ice uh, in the ground on Mars. Uh, 
So uh, the climate of Mars uh, varies over hundreds of thousands of years as the axis of the planet tilts. Uh, the pole of Mars is currently tilted about 25 degrees, which is pr pretty similar to how much Earth is tilted. Uh, but because Mars doesn't have a moon, it wobbles uh, much more significantly. And so you can have very dramatic changes in the climate when the pole tips over much further and is pointed towards the sun. And so this drives variations in the ground ice over time. And so some of the possible explanations for that clean ice are related to this sort of climate change in which uh, the ice may have uh, expanded or retreated. And at some conditions, we may have even had snow settling out at higher latitudes. Uh, but there are some problems with that idea, and there are other possibilities to be investigated as well. But with high rise, we've also found another way to investigate this kind of ground ice. And that's using those same craters that I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is a pair of images from the context camera on MRO. Uh, they were taken in 2008, one of them in June and one of them in August. And what you can see is that this uh, pattern of dark spots appeared. And that's what we expect to see when these new craters form. And so whenever we see this, we try to follow up with high rise to get a very detailed look at the surface at higher resolution. But in this case, uh, the new crater was at about 45 degrees north latitude, just on the edge of where we expect there to be ice. And lo and behold, when we took a look with high-rise, high there was bright bluish material on the floor of several of these little craters. And uh, this tells us, first, that there's ice where we expect it to be, which is good. It's reassuring that our theory is working. It also tells us how deep the ice is. It can't be any deeper than the depth of the crater. And it should be much shallower than that because there's a lot of ice. It shouldn't, the crater didn't just graze the top of it. And it also tells us that this is, again, the same kind of clean ice. Because this image was taken several months after the crater must have formed. And yet the ice is still visible. And on Mars, things evaporate very slowly because it's a very thin atmosphere. But they, ice does sublimate. And if this had been sitting there for several months and the ice wasn't clean, it would just look like dirt. And this was seen at the Phoenix mission in some of their excavations. Uh, they found dirty ice, and two days later, it just looked like dirt. But this actually tells us not just about where there's ice on Mars, uh, but where there's this uh, clean, pure ice as well. And after that first one, uh, the hits just kept coming. Over the next couple months, we found four more of these, uh, all of them at uh, these same mid and high latitude areas, and all of them showing the same kind of clean ice. And over the next year, we keep finding these craters. And uh, the screen seems to be coming out pretty dark, but this is a blast pattern around a crater, except that all around the crater for uh, about 50 feet, uh, you can see this ice has been tossed out. And this crater here, uh, you'll just have to take my word for it, I guess, that there's a crater there, is about, uh, about 50 feet across. It's uh, not a tiny feature. So we've now got a few of these sites, and we can actually compare uh, the places where we've seen these craters with where we predicted uh, the ice would be present. And they actually line up pretty well. Uh, we find them only in the north so far. And the reason for that is uh, the re uh, seen in the background of this figure here. The areas that are red and yellow are the areas of Mars that are dusty. And those are the areas where the blast patterns uh, from the craters show up the best. And so we can most easily find these craters in those areas. And you can see that the places where we're seeing ice are the places that are both dusty and at the latitudes high enough and cold enough uh, that ice should be present. So another interesting uh, feature on Mars that uh, has been discussed a lot over the last 10 years is uh, gullies. Uh, these were uh, seen on crater slopes and on sand dunes. And they're widely taken as evidence for past liquid water. And the reason for this is uh, partially the morphology, which is uh, very hard to make out here, and uh, partially that they occur mostly in the mid-latitudes. Uh, rather than occurring all over the planet, they're found in the areas where ice is expected to come and go uh, as the climate varies. And so one possibility is these are that these are formed from snow that's deposited under some conditions, and then is able to melt. Uh, 
And under those conditions, a little bit of snow and a little bit of water dripping along uh, could actually erode the surface and form some of these gullies. That one's a little better, you can see. Uh, what you can see here is an alcove on the slope of a crater that's been eroded, and then there are channels cutting down. And then at the bottom, there's this apron of material that's been deposited. So it's possible that these were formed in a past climate uh, under different conditions uh, with uh, snow all over the surface. But these actually have uh, some changes that have been seen today. And in uh, 2006, a few new deposits were seen at the toes of some of these gullies. But those uh, could just be due to uh, rock falling, a little bit of minor change. And so we've tried to follow up on this with high rise to see just how significant the activity of these gullies is today. And it turns out that the gullies are changing uh, year to year uh, as we watch. Uh, this is a place called Gasa Crater on Mars. And here again, you see these gullies with the alcoves and the aprons. And in the places where I've got these arrows here, I'll show on the next slide, uh, some new deposits have formed. So in this one here, at the toe of this channel, uh, we can see a color change. And I should say that this is, all of these are false colors. So this blue, uh, in, uh, the color is enhanced. So this is uh, a very, this is a bright deposit. It's relatively blue, but it, the blue doesn't indicate frost or anything necessarily. Uh, you can also see uh, another, in this case, a new dark deposit formed at the toe of this gully. And we were lucky in this case that in that we'd imaged this place with high rise before the gullies formed. And so we were able to take a look before and after with, at very close detail. And what you can see is that there are actual changes in the topography. This isn't just a thin layer of dust drifting down and uh, covering a little bit of the surface. You can actually see here a ridge in the channel was buried or eroded by this flow. And here there are boulders that are uh, about a yard across that came tumbling down the slope and uh, moved uh, tens of feet down the surface. And in other places, we've actually seen uh, what looks like new channels eroding. And uh, these are coming out pretty dark. Uh, this is uh, Matara Crater, uh, sand dunes uh, with another gully, much uh, like the ones that we've seen on the crater walls. And in this case, uh, we see very large changes on the surface. And uh, this is coming out really dark on the screen. But what you can see here are these uh, ripples on the surface. But here in this later image, that helps. So what we can see on the surface, uh, in this first image, there were some of these ripples. In the second image, uh, a few of them are left, but several of them have been covered. And they've been covered by sand that came down from an alcove and. Uh, that's cut a new channel on the surface, and it's buried these ripples. And this is a very large change we're seeing on the surface. This is 25 meters. So this is about the size of a football field here. And these are probably a couple of feet high. So this is enough sand to fill up a house or two. It's a, these are major changes that are happening on Mars today. We're seeing these gullies uh, forming uh, before our eyes. Uh, this one is uh, uh, also dark, so we must have some contrast issues here. Uh, that one's probably not going to come out at all. Uh, but this is uh, just an example of uh, another case where we're seeing large changes in these gullies on dunes on the Martian surface. Now, the reason that this is surprising is that uh, the way sand dunes on Earth work, or the way they move, is by these small avalanches, like this one here. This is one that we saw in the Kelso dunes in 2006. And so you expect a sand dune to have avalanches on the steep slopes, but you expect them to only go, be going forward a few inches. So what this tells us uh, is that these huge changes that we're seeing, they're not just these little avalanches that are moving a few inches forward and building up a layer an inch thick. That was in one or a couple of moments uh, hundreds of yards of sand moving down slope and being deposited far away from the steep slope of the sand dune. So this tells us that what's happening on these dunes isn't just uh, the wind blowing a little bit of sand over the crest and uh, having it topple down slope. This is instead something 
uh, more significant. And a clue to what's happening comes from taking a look at these gullies in the winter. And so this is the crest of a dune. And so you can see channels cut into the face of the dune. And at the top, in some of these alcoves, there's bright bluish material. And what this is is, again, that same carbon dioxide frost, the dry ice frost that we were talking about earlier. And in some of these alcoves, it builds up. And what seems to be happening is that it's uh, causing the slopes to become unstable. And by some process, driving uh, the dunes to collapse and uh, sending material down slope. And we can take a look at the timing of many of these changes as we look at these gullies. And almost all of them seem to be occurring in the winter. So that's, again, consistent uh, with these uh, activity on Mars being mobilized by dry ice. And so in this case, it's still not completely understood what's happening, whether the ice is sublimating and moving sand that way, or whether the weight of the ice is enough to cause the slope to fail and uh, go sliding down the dune. But whatever it is, it's causing very large changes in these Martian gullies. And so what we're actually seeing is gully formation on Mars today. So at least some of these gullies are not relics of uh, some ancient climate where there was uh, snow melting. They're actually forming today. And they're forming in a very interesting and unexpected way that we would not have predicted uh, 10 years ago. We see similar frost in some of the uh, gullies that occur on crater slopes rather than on sand dunes. Uh, these appear to be a bit less active because the sand uh, on the dunes is much weaker. Uh, but the same sort of activity seems to be occurring. And so uh, summing all this up, I think we can say that although Mars is an extremely cold and dry place, it's also one that today is very active. It's changing probably as we speak. And it's currently winter on Mars right now. And hopefully in the next few months, I'm hoping to be looking at more images of these same gullies and seeing, again, more boulders tumbling down and uh, more sand piling up at the base of these dunes. And it's, uh, uh, to Mars is now a very exciting and dynamic place uh, to be watching with high rise. And so with that, I'll take this talk off into the sunset. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. It actually turns out that it's exactly the same. Uh, the, what matters is uh, essentially the way the particles fit together. And so the angle of repose slope uh, turns out to not depend on gravity. Uh, yeah, that's actually that's uh, been discussed a lot recently. It's uh, probably it was frost uh, forming on the legs. Uh, the other idea was that it was actually uh, liquid water with a lot of salt uh, forming beads on the surface. Uh, frost is probably the more likely explanation, but uh, there, some of the ice uh, from the surface uh, could have been kicked up when it was landing, uh, and. The surface also contained perchlorate, which is, uh, uh, helps. Uh, it's a deliquescent salt. And so when, if that's stuck to the legs, uh, some water vapor in the atmosphere could condense on it and actually form a sort of brine. Could the remainder itself be covered with ice? Uh, yeah. The next winter, uh, the same uh, CO2 frost uh, forms all over the surface. And it forms you know, maybe this thick at the latitude of the lander. So the lander was probably crushed under the weight of that. Yeah. About that, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, gravity is uh, dependent on distance. So because Mars is smaller, uh, with less mass, you can get 40%. Uh, It's uh, probably a mix of uh, powdered rock. Uh, it's 
Uh, the composition it includes a little bit of carbonate. It's probably a lot of fine chips of basalt uh, that have been sandblasted off the rocks. And it's probably also some bits of those uh, sedimentary rocks uh, that I showed at the beginning. Uh, those are relatively weak and erodible, so sand blasting them probably knocks off dust as well. And it gets mixed around by large dust storms. It's actually, across the entire surface, the dust is almost exactly the same stuff. Uh, well, the dust storms uh, come and go, and high rise is actually a little too detailed to look at dust storms very well. Uh, the dust storms cover thousands of miles. Sometimes they cover the entire planet. And so looking at a patch that's a couple miles wide and a couple miles long generally just looks like a blank cloud of dust to high rise. So there was actually a planet circling dust storm in 2007 that caused us a lot of grief because we couldn't see through the dust for weeks. And uh, we've seen smaller dust storms as well. Uh, and actually, one of the more exciting or more interesting things is to see little dust devils. So you can see these in the desert uh, north of here. You can also see them on Mars. And where you've got uh, differential heating of the surface, you can get air rising and twisting. And uh, it forms dust devils on Mars. And we can actually see them with high rise uh, making streaks along the surface as they disturb the dust. Uh, depends on how th thick a core you want. Uh, there's, uh, for, I think uh, in 2018, there's been discussion of a European lander uh, that might have a core drill that would be able to drill down about uh, six feet. So if you got that into an area of soft rock or the soil on the surface, uh, you could get a sample to about that depth. Uh, more speculatively, it's been discussed uh, whether you could land something up on one of the ice caps and actually essentially melt your way down and uh, sample that way, uh, get a core through the ice. And that's uh, not been studied as well. It's probably technically feasible, but it would, it's years away from doing. Any more questions? Uh, I'm actually not sure. It's uh, 20,000 pixels across. Uh, it's probably, you know, it's essentially a, a stripe of a CCD rather than a square. And it's, I don't know, actually know the size of it. Uh, the camera itself, the telescope, is uh, about uh, this big in diameter. Yep. That's an interesting question. Uh, it, it probably would. Uh, there'd be uh, less uh, force slowing it down in the thin, thin atmosphere. Uh, there'd be less atmospheric drag, so that might also have an effect. But on the other hand, it might not be, get going as fast because there's less gravitational acceleration to get it going. OK, then uh, let's thank Colin once more. And don't go away because we have a raffle. And your last duty will be to pull the winning raffle tickets here. All right. Let's see, 984031. We have a winner. Okay. Down or I'll take it up. Okay. One more, right? One more. Okay. And nine eight four zero one four. Right here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, and so I thank you all for coming and remind you again, we've got one more lecture, which will be Tuesday the 16th. Um, David Choi talking about a weather report for our solar system and beyond. Have a good night. Oh, so, same time, same place, 7 o'clock Tuesday.